This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. In history, there have been several monarchs known as Mad Kings, rulers who are plagued by erratic and even violent behavior often attributed to mental illness. Henry VI of England suffered a mental breakdown that left him in a catatonic stupor for more than a year. Ivan the Terrible, the first Tsar of Russia, was given his nickname after torturing and sadistically murdering members of the nobility. He even murdered his own son in a fit of rage. And England's King George III, whose reign was portrayed so dramatically in the 1994 film, The Madness of King George, experienced hallucinations, paranoia, and general mental breakdown while he ruled. We could speculate that the madness attributed to so many monarchs could be as a result of genetic predisposition to mental illness, seeing as royal rule is inherited. Or it's possible that the demands of the job creates a level of stress that may send some who are emotionally fragile to begin with over the edge. And especially in past history, royal rulers had to constantly be on alert for enemies who may seek to overthrow them and take the throne. Whatever the reason, the stories of these mad kings, queens, and other rulers have always fascinated me. The stories are quite dramatic. A ruler with that much power, suffering from paranoia, illusions, and out-of-control anger issues can become a tyrant of the worst sort. This is one such story that I've chosen to round out our series, Royal Murders, Scandals, and Secrets, Mad King Eric of Sweden. We're going to do this episode a little bit differently. I do this every once in a while. It's kind of the same format I use for Patreon. I have all the details in a very detailed outline, but I'm going to give it a little bit more of a casual feel, reciting the information to you without a script. King Edward XIV was born on December 13, 1533, as Eric Vasa at the Royal Castle in Stockholm, Sweden. He was the heir to King Gustav I and Queen Catherine of saxe lauenburg he was the only child born to the king and queen. Queen Catherine passed away just before Eric was two years old. King Gustav would marry his second wife, Margareta, the following year. They would have 11 children, so Eric would have 11 half-brothers and sisters. King Gustav I was the first monarch to be succeeded by his heirs. Before then, the Kingdom of Sweden had been an elective monarchy, with kings chosen from prominent families. As a child, Eric was very bright. He had an interest in astrology, in music, and was an accomplished writer. He received a Renaissance education, including geography, history, and political thought. He was very skilled in foreign languages and played the lute, and he even wrote his own lute compositions. Military science was his special interest. And I'm going to mention really quickly here his tutor, who was Dionysius Boreas, because he's going to come into play later on in the story. But he was Eric's math tutor and also his biggest supporter. As he matured, Eric became a womanizer, he was called, who courted many, many girls and women, and he even asked several to marry him, so you might say he was the romantic type. These women included Renata of Lorraine and Mary Queen of Scots, and also Elizabeth I, who all rejected his proposals. As in most royal families, he was tasked with marrying from within another royal family for political reasons and also to um, expand their empire. But for whatever reason, um, which I did not find a lot of information about, he was not successful with women. And in depictions of him and in, in reports, he said he was, you know, a good looking man. He had red hair and a very long beard. He was very physically healthy. And like I already said, he was very um, accomplished in a lot of things. He was very intelligent and, and creative. But uh, one thing that I did kind of read in passing was that he may have come on a little too strong. He may have been a little bit too ardent in his pursuit of these women. And we'll get some indication of this in just a moment. But 
as most people know, we like people to show interest in us romantically, but we don't like them to be too pushy, right? He did have a long-term mistress, Agda Purse daughter. Purse daughter. Purse daughter. Purse daughter. I think this is spelled wrong. <laughs> The one thing I know about these Swedish names is the daughter part means what it sounds like. She was the daughter of somebody named Purse or Percy or something like that. Aga Purse's daughter. So in 1558, at the age of 25, Eric chose Agda as his official mistress. So he had all these other, you know, dalliances, but this was the woman he was going to make his long-term partner. They had two children together, two daughters, Virginia and Constantina. If we talk about King Eric, or Prince Eric at this point, we have to talk about Elizabeth I, who, of course, would go on to be Queen Elizabeth I, um, who is also known as the Virgin Queen. Now, she was known as the Virgin Queen because she never married. You guys know the story. She never married. But Eric was obsessed with Queen Elizabeth I. He pursued her for a very long time, and this was against his father's wishes. His father did not want him to court Queen Elizabeth. But Elizabeth was known to have a lot of suitors, of course. You know, she had a lot of power. <clears throat> she was single. She was uh, very much admired. And she learned to not flat out say no to these men, but just kind of almost like a little flirty energy, and she would kind of string them along, right? Because she didn't want to burn any bridges politically, but she also was not interested. She was not really interested in marrying any of these men who pursued her or marrying anyone in general because she never did marry. So she strung Eric along. In 1560, Eric had decided he wasn't going to wait anymore. He was going to go to England, and he was going to convince her that he was the man for her. But during this time, he was still with Agda. And right before he set sail for England, he broke it off with Magda, and he even left his children behind. He was just done. He said, I am all in on uh, Liz, and I don't want anybody else. But right before he set sail, he had already received a letter from Elizabeth saying, I'm not interested. Dude, come on, let it go. But obviously, this didn't dissuade him. This is the letter she sent. And you could tell that it's pretty clear what she was saying. She basically told him, don't bother with the trip. Quote, while we, okay, first before I start, I have to say, Elizabeth, so cool. She gets to use the royal we, okay? <laughs> I think we should all start using the royal we. It's just very cool. Okay, this is what she's saying. Talking about herself, of course, but saying we. Quote, while we perceive therefrom that the zeal and love of your mind towards us is not diminished, Yet in part we are grieved that we cannot satisfy your serene highness with the same kind of affection. And that indeed does not happen because we doubt in any way of your love and honor. But as often we have testified both in words and in writing that we have never yet conceived a feeling of that kind of affection towards anyone. We therefore beg your serene highness again and again that you be pleased to set a limit to your love that it advance not beyond the laws of friendships for the present, nor disregard them in future. I have always given both to your brother, who is certainly a most excellent prince and deservedly very dear to us, and also to your ambassador likewise, the same answer with scarcely any variation of the words, that we do not conceive in our heart to take a husband, but highly commend the single life and hope that your serene highness will not longer spend time in waiting for us. End quote. Beautiful. <laughs> Meanwhile, didn't get the hint. Still set sail. But Eric never made it to England. It's a long trip. And on September 29, 1560, he received the news that his father, King Gustav, had died. So now he succeeded to the throne as the King of Sweden. He was now King Eric XIV. He was referred to as the chosen king and given the title of the hereditary king. He gave himself the name of Eric XIV, but there wasn't 13 Erics before him. So you're probably thinking, geez, there's a lot of Erics. No, he and his half-brother Charles assigned themselves regal numbers, partially based on fictitious histories of Sweden. I don't know why he just didn't want to be Eric I, but he decided Eric XIV. Maybe it was his lucky number. I don't know. Okay. So now let's talk about his reign. King Eric XIV, as soon as he was placed on the throne, officially, 
He gathered his half-brothers, John and Charles, who were the next two to succeed him, and he demoted them from their title of duke. Eric was an opponent of Swedish nobility. He considered all Swedish nobles rivals for his throne, of course, because that's the way it had happened before, that they had been placed in power as the king. But now he's like, okay, let's get rid of nobles because I don't want anybody gunning for my position. This, as you can imagine, didn't go over very well because not only does it diminish their power, but their wealth and their titles and all of those things. And of course, his own brothers were dukes. So, you know, we've got a problem here. He was especially suspicious of his half-brothers attempting to get rid of him to take the throne. Now, any monarch was going to be a little bit paranoid, a little bit suspicious, because like I mentioned in the intro, there's always this power struggle, right? And they always have to, you know, watch their back. Who's going to try to take them down and take over power? But we'll see that his paranoia and his suspicion becomes off the charts. In this royal family, anyway, there was a lot of paranoia and rivalry between the half-siblings. Their father, Gustav, was said to also be a very contentious man and a stern leader, and he also had these ideas about quashing anybody who may even become one of your enemies. So Eric had a little bit of a role model in that. But in 1563, so just after taking the throne within a couple of years, King Eric's courtiers noticed a change in his personality. He was more paranoid, and his thoughts became illogical. His rule started to be known as marked by violence. King Eric started to believe that all the nobles were plotting against him, and when his brother John, the Duke of Finland, married a Polish princess against Eric's wishes, he began to be openly hostile towards his brothers, which led, of course, to increased political tensions. He then had his brother John arrested for high treason. Torture was not legal in Sweden at this time unless the person had already been sentenced to death. For whatever reason, this was the way it worked in uh, the laws then. Because of this, over 300 nobles were sentenced to death by King Eric, and they were then, of course, tortured. So we're going to talk about Niels Sture, S-T-U-R-E. He was the heir of a powerful Swedish family. Now, Niels Sture became King Eric's arch-rival, arch-enemy. And it's weird because, again, like I said, the illogical kind of thought process, there was no real reason to pick out Niels above anybody else or that anything had particularly happened to make him very suspicious of Nils or anything like that. He just chose this. Now, here's one of the reasons, and this will kind of tell you about his mental state and how it was going. He initially grew suspicious of poor Nils Sturr because the king's horoscope told him that a light-haired man would succeed him. Well, I'm kind of wondering, in Sweden, aren't most people light-haired? <laughs> Maybe Nils was particularly light-haired. Maybe he had very, you know, blonde hair. I don't know. But he accused Nils of treason, believing that he would try to take his throne. He was also paranoid because although he had several illegitimate children, he had no legal heir to succeed him. So he was kind of stuck for an heir at that time. Nils Sturr was sentenced to death, but then his sentence was commuted, and instead the king subjected him to a humiliating spectacle. On June 15, 1566, Neil Sturr was made to be driven through Stockholm in a broken down carriage while wearing a straw hat. And in Sweden, a straw hat at that time symbolized shame. It's kind of like in America, there's this, you know, this old, old thing of you know, wearing a dunce cap. It's like this pointed conical kind of hat you have to wear if you're the dumb kid in the class, which is also very cruel. But, you know, that's just kind of in cartoons and things. Anyway, this was a shameful thing to do to him. And he had already been beaten, I mean, badly beaten. So he was bleeding, he was wounded as he was driven through town wearing this straw hat. So it was really uh, quite a spectacle. There's another very important person in uh, Eric XIV's life. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about her. And she's going to come into play a lot in this uh, episode. We'd like to thank our new sponsor, Factor, for sponsoring today's show. So let's say you've decided to make eating better a part of your 2024 goals. But if you're like me, you probably find figuring out new recipes, shopping, and preparing meals is just too time-consuming for your busy schedule. So what do you do? I've got a great suggestion for you. Try Factor Meals. Factor's delicious, ready-to-eat meals make eating better every day easier. 
Factors pre-prepared, chef-created, and dietitian approved meals are delivered right to your door. And Factor gives you so many options to choose from that you're sure to find just the right fit for your nutrition needs and your taste preferences. I watch both carbs and calories, so I love Factor, which has both carb-conscious and calorie-smart meals. They also have keto, protein plus, and vegan and veggie options. You can customize your meals from over 35 different options every week. New meals are added all the time, but you can also choose from popular favorites. Some of those popular favorites include loaded bacon shredded chicken with sautéed spinach and ranch sour cream, and chimichurri pork tenderloin with red pepper cauliflower mash and roasted squash. There are also a variety of easy options for breakfast, snacks, and more. Cooking for one can be a challenge, but Factor meals are perfectly portioned and easy to heat up for one person with no leftovers wasted. Get as many or as few meals as you like by choosing 6 to 18 meals per week, depending on your needs. Head to factormeals.com slash once50 and use code once50 to get 50% off. That's a great discount just for our listeners. That's code once50 at factormeals.com slash once50 for 50% off. Karen Mann's Daughter. In 1564, the king met Karen, who was employed as a servant to his court musician. So she wasn't a lady in waiting. She wasn't a, a part of the nobility or anything. She was a servant. Her mother came from a family of peasants in Upland, and her father was a soldier and later was a prison guard. So they were just normal people. But when he saw Karen, he became infatuated with her and he made her his mistress in 1565. Like I mentioned before, he'd had many other mistresses, but he dismissed all of them after meeting Karen. He permanently got rid of Agda, remember, the one I talked about that had his children. He also had other children from other people, but she was like the official, the official mistress, right? And he got rid of Agda by accusing her of being an unfit mother. And he sent Agda away and he sent his children away from Agda to go live with his sister because he couldn't very well say, oh, she's an unfit mother and okay, take them away because those are your children. I mean, how would that look as the king? Um, so he sent the children to live with his sister and he sent Agda off to whatever her next you know, place was going to be. So King Eric XIV treated their relationship with Karen as an official position. He moved her into the palace. He gave her her own staff. He gave her her own suite of apartments in the palace. He also provided her with a makeover, um, you know, just dolled her all up, provided her with an expensive wardrobe. And she was also given an education. She had court educators and tutors, and she learned to read and write. He also had her appear with him openly at court, which is something that wasn't done either. And again, people are starting to wonder, okay, this guy, he's not all there mentally because of the way he'd already been acting. But then he takes this nobody and makes her like nobility in the palace and they just didn't understand it. So what people started to say, well, this woman must be a witch or she's paid a witch to make a love potion to put the king under her spell. They really didn't understand what he saw in her and especially the way he bestowed all the honor and the riches on her. She was a daughter of peasants. This caused people to talk and, you know, these kind of rumors came up out of it. But before she became the king's mistress, Karen was engaged to another man named Maximilian. She had dumped him for the king, but Maximilian still was kind of writing to her, wanting to woo her back. Now, the story goes that Maximilian snuck into the palace and tried to persuade Karen to come back to him. Now, you got to imagine, if that's true, this guy had a huge ego. I mean, how do you win this woman back from, from the king, right? So, but that might not be the true story. Anyway, let me give you the outcome of this first. The story goes, when the king found out about Maximilian, found out he was in the palace, he had him brought before the authorities and had him executed immediately. He did get executed. We do know that. But a later historical chronicle of this incident has provided some evidence that Maximilian may have been set up by the king because he was jealous, because he knew that this man had initially been engaged to Karen, and he was jealous. So he'd asked Karen to send for Maximilian. He may have thought, oh, she wants to talk to me. 
went to the palace and then fell into this trap in which he was executed. I want to talk a little bit about Karen's influence on uh, King Eric because she had quite a bit. So it looks like Karen had a very positive influence on the king and she conducted herself in a dignified and a classy manner. She was described by some as very beautiful with long blonde hair and quote, innocent eyes. Her personality was reported as calm, humble, and serene. And as the king became more unstable, she seems to have been the only one to be able to calm him down. Some people, including the nobles, even appealed to her when they needed to have the king listen to reason. There's actually a painting. Now, this was painted 300 years after his reign. But what the painting shows is a portrait of the king on the floor, quote, confused by his inner demons, with Karen at his side holding his hand, looking like an angel, end quote. And also in the painting, you see King Eric's advisor standing nearby, and he's trying to get him to sign a document. So what it's showing is he's overwhelmed by whatever and not being able, able to do his job. And Karen has to be by his side to kind of help him just being able to deal with these things. Eric's family thought that Karen was very good for his mood and was grateful for her presence. She intervened for many people who were arrested and brought before the king the king calling for these people's arrests, and we'll talk about this in a minute. Because of her influence, they were later pardoned. She was even able to negotiate a period of peace between the king and his brother, Duke John. But in many ways, she was still not respected at court. And of course, this was due to her humble background. And some people thought that the marriage was a scandal. This is where those charges of witchcraft seem to stem from. In a letter to Eric's half-sister, a court member wrote this, quote, the lunacy which dominates him is a consequence of his deeds. He was somewhat unstable even before, and now he is completely so, guided by his wife. She was one of the people at court who was saying that Karen was a witch. When the king became so mentally ill that there were times that he couldn't even function, a regent was appointed to be in his place for official business. So I don't know if he was exactly bedridden or or what, but he, Meanwhile, he was just not present to deal with, you know, government issues. And so a regent would step in and deal with that during those times. But eventually he would always bounce back and then resume his duties. This happened several times in 1566 and 1567, which is kind of the worst times of all of this was going on. In 1566, Eric asked Nils Sturr to repent for his sins. Remember, he's thinking this is something the king just had in his head but to repent for his sins and help him out with a plan. Eric sent Nils off as an official bridal envoy to Renata of Lorraine. Now, he was, what he was saying was, Nils, you're going to go and you're going to speak for me and you're going to try to persuade uh, Renata of Lorraine to marry me. But this was all just a cover-up. Eric had set all this up to send Niels away. It looked good, like, okay, the king's back in his right mind. He's going to actually marry somebody who's royal or noble. All of this stuff with Karen the witch is, you know, that, that's in the past. But he actually was secretly planning to marry Karen. This was just all a ruse. He was very paranoid now that his courtiers would try to stop the wedding. And again, in his mind, Nils was the one who was setting all this in motion, like he was having these secret meetings and he was getting everybody on his side to do all these things against the king. So he fixated on him as the scapegoat for all his paranoia. Historical records note that in 1567, King Eric suffered a mental collapse and his behavior became even more erratic. In 1567, he did marry Karen and made her his queen, but she would style herself as chosen queen and never just queen because she knew that her position was not fully accepted by the aristocracy. She does seem to be very rational and very practical in the way that she does things. She wasn't trying to, like, push too many buttons or anything like that. Um, she was careful. It was reported now that the king had plans to have his brothers and his other quote-unquote enemies killed before his wedding. But Karen warned these people of these plans. Through the queen dowager, Catherine, this is Eric's stepmother. These people who he was going to have killed, didn't come to town to attend the wedding. 
I mean, you could have had this whole red wedding scene, right? But Karen was the one that headed off at the pass. So she helped these people to not come for a wedding and end up in their doom, right? The king and Karen's children were present at the royal wedding. And this was something that was never done before either. Now, here's the thing. You could think, okay, well, he was a progressive king, but most people just saw this as, as signs of his instability, his mental instability. The children were actually placed under the banner between their parents as they took their vows. Even Karen's peasant relatives, three of her maternal uncles, attended the wedding, which, I mean, come on. You, you just don't invite peasants to the palace, right? At least <laughs> they didn't at that time. And they were even given suits of clothes to wear by the royal tailor. So treated very well. That's really nice. In May of 1567, when Niels returned from his fake mission, I mean, can you imagine he had some egg on his face when he went over there? And they're like, what are you talking about? Nobody proposed. What, what, are, we, what are you doing? You know, like, I don't even know what, what that had to be like. But, but when he returned, King Eric had him uh, imprisoned at Uppsala Castle. Now, there was already other nobles who are uh, imprisoned by the king, you know, waiting there when Nils joined them. Nils' father, Svante, was also there, and, and like many other nobles. Um, and again, there was nothing really against Nils. We continue with King Eric experiencing more erratic behavior. He started wandering around the dungeons at Uppsala Castle. Now, some people say that the things he was doing to these perceived enemies, imprisoning people, having people executed, torturing them, you know, shaming them, was actually making his mental instability worse, which you can imagine. This is something that I think would weigh on your soul. I mean, you'd hope, right? And it made his thought process even more scattered, and he became more mentally unstable. When all this was going on, a noblewoman appealed to Queen Karen, asking her to intervene with her husband to make sure the prisoners weren't harmed. Because they knew they couldn't go to the king. He couldn't be talked to. So now people were starting to appeal to the queen. Please step in. Do something. So apparently this conversation must have taken place between the king and the queen. Because later that morning, the king visits Fonte Stir. And he fell on his knees before Mr. Stir and asked him for forgiveness. And most, of course, believe this was Karen's influence on him. So this seemed like it was going in a better direction. But the king was so erratic at this point that this remorse didn't last very long. And he didn't have anybody released from prison. And then the hammer fell. A few hours after this visit to Uppsala Castle, King Eric XIV went back into the castle, went to the dungeon, the prison where these men were being held, went into the cell where Neil Stir was, took out his dagger, and he stabbed Neil Stir in the chest and he left him there to die in his cell. Nils was dying a very painful death, and I guess this was the king's attempt at mercy. He had one of his soldiers finish killing Nils by stabbing him again. After doing this, the king walked over to Svante's cell, who had just asked forgiveness from hours earlier, and he said that he had to kill him because he knew that he would never forgive him for having just killed his son. Well, makes sense, but... My gosh. After these murders, Eric ordered his men to massacre almost all of the remaining prisoners. So they were all killed. While he was leaving the castle, you could imagine what kind of state he was in at this point. Full-blown, you know, just breakdown here. There's, there's no reason. He's become extremely violent, extremely paranoid. While he's leaving the castle, the king runs into his old tutor. I mentioned very early in the episode. Dionysius. His tutor, having always been a big supporter of the king and the king always having a lot of love for his tutor, he tries to calm Eric down by saying, you're better than this, who, you know, whatever words he used, right? But that proved to be a big mistake. Eric then thanked his tutor and then ordered his men to kill him on the spot. That was it. He obviously was unraveling at this point. King Eric wandered into the forest, and he went missing for two days. Everyone was out looking for him. On May 27, 1567, the king was found in a tiny village called Odensala. And he was in a very strange state, having a full-blown breakdown, and he was dressed as a peasant. He seemed to not even be aware of who he was at the moment. There's a little bit of a blank spot here of what happened after this. I would imagine that... 
he had to be cared for and a regent was put in his place at this time, like had been done before. And then he eventually came back to his senses somewhat. Then they had the queen's coronation. So he actually had an official coronation for Karen in 1568. But soon after the queen's coronation, the king's brothers, John and Charles, now led a rebellion against the king. He's like, this, this can't, this guy is just not in his right mind. We need to shut this down. So they overthrew the king at this point, and John was put into power. When John became king, his first point of action was to throw Eric in prison. Now, when royals, especially at that high level, were imprisoned, they weren't in prison like they were in a little jail or a dungeon. They were in a palace. They were just being held under guard in a palace. Eric and Karen were put in prison together. King John basically made a pronouncement that said Eric was insane and so had to be taken out of power, and that's why he was taking power. Now, at first, Eric and Karen's children were placed in the care of the Queen Dowager Catherine, his stepmother, and a governess, but they were reunited with their parents in 1570, so about a year and some months later. The children were also imprisoned with them, kept under lock and key. They actually had two more children while they were imprisoned, the first in 1570 and the other in 1572, but both children did not live past infancy. Didn't say exactly why they died, but they, but they died while they were still in captivity. In 1569, an escape plot was hatched by a group, including Karen's head lady-in-waiting, a woman named Ellen Andrestotter, and her personal secretary, Thomas Jacobson. The plot was discovered, and both Andrus' daughter and Jacobson were executed. On June 14, 1573, King John separated Eric and Karen from each other in order to prevent them from having any more children. Because you've got to remember, every one of these children that they have, the males especially, of course, were a threat to King John or whoever would succeed him. Because sometimes it's the citizens, the people, that will rebel against the king and try to put the former king or who they think should be the king or the sovereign in their place. So this is always a, a threat to them. So like, look, let's just stop them from having children. Let's just separate them. Karen and her children, the two that were still living, the first two, were sent to a castle in Finland. And here she remained under house arrest with her children. It's a sad thing because obviously Eric was very dependent on his wife and also loved his wife dearly. He wrote this in his diary, quote, my wife has been taken from me by use of violence, end quote. It is known that the king was being physically abused by his jailers on at least three occasions that were re recorded in history. Um, but we don't know if this was done in front of his children or if anything happened, you know, to Karen. We don't have any evidence of that. But in 1575, Karen's son was taken away from her. Now, remember, he's still in line of succession to the throne, right? He was taken away from her and sent to Poland to be placed in the care of Jesuit priests. Her daughter, however, was allowed to remain with her. King Eric XIV was held in captivity for seven years in total. At least two more plots to reinstate the king, like what I was talking about, were attempted. And he and Karen were apart for four years. On February 26, 1577, King Edward XIV of Sweden was found cold and unresponsive in his cell. Was this a natural death? No. The government had faced one too many attempts to reinstate him. Like I said, there were people trying to put him back on the throne. I didn't re go into the whole history of, of, unfortunately, of Sweden. It's very interesting, though. If there's a good movie about this, I would, I would love to watch it. I just don't have time to read a whole book right now. Um, but I would love to watch this. It sounds very interesting to me. Um, but, you know, maybe for whatever reason, they didn't like John or, you know, whoever. I think King John was, I believe King John or the next king, I did read a little bit, um, was on the throne for over 20 years. So maybe it was King John. I don't know. Maybe they didn't like him. I don't know. But anyway, they wanted to stop these people from trying to put King Eric back on the throne. And it was just too big of a threat. So somebody plotted to have him killed. He was found, like I said, dead in his cell. But they didn't know why. I guess there was you know, rumors and speculation. But it wasn't until 1958 and that'd be another thing to read about that'd be interesting, why this happened and, and who undertook it and everything. But of course, we have forensics now. Forensic specialists exhumed the king's body, and it was discovered that his last meal of pea soup had been spiked with arsenic. 
and this is what killed him. Now, there's other accounts that say just, I guess, logically that it's more likely that the arsenic would be in his wine because the normal drink would be wine. But traditionally, it has been said that King Eric died from eating poisoned pea soup. So you'll find that if you ever look him up. Okay, at this point, since he was dead, his widow was released from prison. And she was treated very well, which kind of nice. Unfortunately, they killed her husband. But she was given a royal estate in Finland where she lived out the rest of her life. In 1587, her daughter named Sigrid was made lady-in-waiting to the new king, John III's daughter, Princess Anna. So she was allowed to be at court and be a lady-in-waiting, which is an honor. Sigrid and her mother were able to travel to Warsaw with Princess Anna when she went there to visit her brother, who had been elected the king of Poland. Being very nice to Karen, of course she's going to take her lady-in-waiting with her, But she also took her mother. Why? Because remember, her son, whose name was Gustav, her son who had been taken away from her 12 years earlier, was in Poland. He was in Warsaw. So they were able to finally reunite after 12 years. She had not seen her son in 12 years. When she saw her son, there was some changes. Of course, he's 12 years older. He is also now a Catholic. He had forgotten how to speak Swedish. And he didn't really remember his mom, which is really sad. But she still helped to support him. He had been raised by the Jesuits and now was working as a soldier of fortune. So he was basically would go fight these battles for pay, right? This is what soldier, soldiers, like hired soldiers, that's what they're called, soldiers of fortune. So he was pretty much penniless. He was, you know, of very meager means. So she continued to support him financially. And she tried to get permission for him to return to Sweden. But as you can imagine, King was like, nah. You know, you could see him. That's great. I'm glad you had a nice reunion. But we're not bringing that guy who could be a threat to us if people try to put him back on the throne. We can't have him back here in Sweden. So he would later die in captivity as a prisoner in Russia. He had been fighting one of these battles, uh, was captured, put in prison, and he died there. But her daughter Sigrid would later marry a Swedish nobleman and live a pretty good life. Karen was very well liked and respected in Finland. Uh, During the Great Peasant Rebellion of 1597, the rebels refrained from plundering her estate. The peasants were rebelling against the nobility, plundering estates, and they basically skipped hers because they liked her. She came from peasant family as well, so maybe that was one of the reasons they had a little bit more um, esteem for her. She managed her estate very, very well, so she was smart too. It became one of the most lucrative estates in Finland. And she died peacefully there after a brief illness in 1612. So that is the story of King Eric XIV, another one of these mad kings. I thought it was a very interesting story, and I hope you did too. So that will do it for this episode of Once Upon a Crime. Join us on Patreon if you'd like to get a bonus episode every month ad-free for as little as a $2 a month membership. Go to patreon.com slash onceuponacrime. You can still vote for Once Upon a Crime for the 2024 True Crime Awards Listener's Choice category. We would love your support. Go to truecrimeawards.co.uk and click on Listener's Choice to get your vote in. Voting closes on March 31st, so get your vote in today. Thank you so much. There's a link in the show notes. I will be at CrimeCon in Nashville in May and CrimeCon UK in London in September. I'm so looking forward to that. For more information and to purchase tickets, go to truecrimepodcast.com and click on upcoming events. Use my offer code listed on the website and in the show notes for discounted tickets. I can't wait to meet you on Podcast Row. Once Upon a Crime is written and produced by me, Esther Sanchez Ludlow. My administrative and production assistant is Lorena Garcia. And research for this episode was provided by Emma Battaglia. Until next time, be good to one another.